Okay, hello everyone. I'm, I'm sorry for the late start. A uh, little bit of laptop trouble, but I'm uh, on a Chromebook now, so uh, maybe uh, I should have done that from the start. So my name's Simon Glass. I'm, gonna, I'm here to talk uh, a little bit abbreviatedly about what's new in Uboot. Uh, so here's my goals of this talk. I will say that I'm, uh, I don't know everything about Uboot. It's a huge project, but I, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about things I know about than things that I don't, and it's only natural, right? Um, and I also, uh, I also know that some people use quite old versions of, of Uboot. How many of you are using a Uboot that's five years old? Yeah, what about two, two years old or more? Yeah, so it's not very common to update your U-boot. So some of these things, uh, I will mention some things that have happened perhaps older than two years ago. So just an overview of U-boot. It's been around quite a while. Uh, since 2012, Tom Reedy, Tom Reedy has been the head custodian. And there are about 50 other custodians for different areas of the project. It's about 2.2 million lines of code, but a lot of that is board specific, uh, you know, and drivers and things like that. The amount of code you actually compile into your particular board is considerably less. There's a release cycle that was two months, and now it's three months. There's a lot of contributors, uh, a lot of things going on in the project, and it has quite strong links to Linux. Uh, it uses Linux code style, obviously, and some Linux drivers and so on. So I'm not going to talk about these things, and probably these things have been true five or even ten years ago, um, certainly five years ago. So Uboot has very wide architecture and board support. It has a, uh, a mechanism for loading Uboot, which is you know several hundred k, when you've only got a very small amount of SRAM and you need to get your SDRAM going. That's called uh, TPL and SPL. Uh, it's got pretty wide image support. There's also a, a sandbox architecture, so you can run Uboot on top of Linux just for testing and for development. And so, certainly in my case, uh, any feature development is, is done in sandbox because you can use normal host debugging tools and all that sort of thing. And then it just works as expected on, on the actual board. Uboot has a command line, so when you, when you run it, you just get a command line. Uh, <coughs> I won't be able to run it on this Chromebook, but uh, take my word for it. You can uh, you can run all the different commands and, and and things like you know looking at files in the file system, looking at memory, changing memory, that kind of thing. So here are some things that you may not have known about if you're using the U-boot from four or five years ago. So U-boot has a, a driver model now, which is designed to take care of uh, all the different drive drivers and devices you might have in your system. It uses kbuild and kconfig. Uh, there's, a there's several, actually, there's at least three verified or secure boot mechanisms. Uh, it supports firmware update, uh, fast boot, that sort of thing, and it's attached to the coverity system, so we actually get uh, security uh, emails telling us to go and fix our code, that kind of thing. So just to look at a couple of these things. Um, first of all, driver model. Uh, how many of you have ever have used driver model or seen driver model? Okay, some of you, all right. So it's, um, it's fair to say that it's, uh, it came out in 2004 and I think it's, sorry, 2014. And I think it's settled down a bit now. We have it sort of embedded in most areas of U-Boot. The goal is to, allow you to specify the devices in your system using device tree as we do on Linux. Uh, and by doing that, we can, then, uh, we can then effectively use those devices within U-Boot without having to sort of run a whole lot of code to set them up. So here's an example. On the right, you can see there's an I2C bus. It has a PMIC in it. That PMIC has a LDO. And we want that LDO to be set to 2.8 volts. Uh, and some other things as well. And so there, at the bottom, bottom left, you can see uh, that we're set auto automatically setting the, all the regulators that, that have, that we, where we know the voltage. 
You can imagine behind the scenes what's happening. It's going and finding that PMIC. U-boot has lazy in it, initialization, so it will only do it when it needs to. It will go onto that I2C bus. It will send some register commands to that PMIC to set the voltages, and it will do that for the three different uh, uh, <coughs> regulators that we've mentioned there. So that's something that driver model can do, whereas previously, perhaps you would have had to code all this up with register accesses directly in the, uh, in, in the code, that, in your board code. I'll just mention this. I don't think it's widely used, but there is a mechanism for, uh, for me measuring boot time through the different stages of U-boot, through the different phases, and uh, getting that at a sort of microsecond count to find out where your, boot, where your boot time is going. And there's even a tracing mechanism that lets you see function tracing. Uh, it's a little bit uh, atrophied now, but uh, you can, uh, it will record uh, tracing information. You can actually write it. Here we're writing it using a network TFTP put command uh, to act, and then an analyzing it on the host. Uh, so I want to mention Buildman. A couple of years ago, this, the, there was a script called Make All, which was designed to make all the boards, and that would tell you whether things were good or not. And that got retired in favor of this thing called Buildman. On the, at the bottom right, you can see I'm doing a build, a very ambitious build here. I'm building a tree with 145 commits in it for all of the boards. There's about 1,300 boards in your boot. And it's busy there working away, and it's going to be done in about 24 hours. I didn't continue that, didn't let that finish. But that's, uh, Buildman essentially lets you build any number of commits, uh, it lets you build uh, for any number of boards, you can select architectures and that kind of things. And it hands, handles the tool chain for you, it downloads the tool chains if you ask it to, uh, and it's pretty, pretty easy to use. Uh, and on the top, you've got the analysis phase. So when you, when you say minus S to, to Buildman, it looks at existing build that you've actually completed, and it, here it's telling us where our code size is changing or our data size. Uh, it's a little bit, there's a lot of changes going on here because this is a series which introduces, uh, refactors and introduces SDRAM support for a particular SOC. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of commits. But basically if you look at this, uh, look, look at this here, you can see the uh, text size has gone up by about 60 bytes, which isn't too bad. And some of these functions have gone up in size. Red means they've got bigger. Green means they've got smaller. So it's pretty easy to see where you've made things better or worse in terms of code size. Buildman also supports config changes and environment changes. So now I'm going to talk about some of these new things. This is, I'm, I'm just picking a selection of things uh, that I'm going to, going to mention. Uh, hopefully, uh, if you've not looked at U-Boot in the last couple of years, you won't quite know what these are and you'll learn something. If not, uh, please tell me what you wanted to know afterwards. So the first thing is device tree overlays. Uh, these are not, uh, not needed on every board, but here's an example of a baseboard where we can connect a number of additional add-on boards to it. And the, the device tree basically is used to describe what devices are on that board, and when you add a different adapter board on top, obviously you're changing the devices that are available. And the mechanism used in the kernel to, to support this is uh, device tree overlays. So here on the right, you can sort of see I'm uh, loading in a couple of device trees. Uh, I'm then ap applying the overlay, and now I can see that my display has appeared, whereas previously it wasn't there. So that's a very, very simple example of an of a overlay being applied uh, in U-Boot. Um, and uh, so, so when we have a, uh, an add-on board, we can access its peripherals. If you do this early enough in U-Boot, then U-Boot can use those peripherals uh, too. U-Boot uh, you, you can use that same device tree. Uh, so obviously that's supported in U-Boot and SPL work is in progress. Um, it's also possible to do this uh, within Linux, but the nice thing about having it early and having it ready to go is everything is, everything is consistent. So U-Boot's had device tree for quite a while, but it was a little bit clunky. Um, there's a new interface called a live tree interface. Uh, the code for that was largely copied out of Linux. Uh, essentially, there's a new API called dev read, and you use that now to say, you know, read a, read a device tree property from 
uh, from, the, from the device tree. So we've got some, several examples here. The, the simplest one is on the bottom left here where we're reading, uh, reading uh, Boolean values from, from the device tree. And that's just going to read it from the node associated with that device. Uh, and we've got other things here like reading the address of the peripheral and uh, reading resources and so on. Um, so it's a fairly consistent interface. You don't have to worry about device tree pointers or anything like that. If you have not got config OF live enabled, it will still work. The dev read interface still works. It's transparent. It'll just it'll work no matter, no matter whether it's a live tree or a flat tree. So in Uboot now, we're trying to use this interface in preference to anything else. So this is a little bit of a crazy thing. Um, it's not really widely used in, in Uboot, but it, there are about, I think, five or 10 boards that use it. The, the device tree does add overhead. Uh, typically, the code size increase on, uh, on ARM is 3K, 3 or 4K. And the device tree itself, I mean, obviously, the device trees are typically 40, 60K, or even 100K in size. What we do in Uboot is we, we actually grep down the, FP, the uh, the device tree and remove the things that aren't used in SPL. So SPL is a very small memory constrained thing. We can typically get the device tree down to about 3K in SPL. Uh, so the overhead typically is 6 to 7K, which is not too bad. But if you've only got 32K of RAM, it's uh, VSRAM, it's, it's too much. So this is a scheme for converting the device tree into C automatically. Um, you can see what it's doing here. On the top right, you've got a uh, device tree node for a memory controller. And here's what it produces. It produces this uh, declaration in the header file here. And then it produces the actual contents of the device tree here, and then declares a U-boot device. Um, so hopefully that makes some sort of sense. You can see what's going on. The point is, when you run SPL now, you don't need the device tree. It's actually it's just not, it's not necessary at all. You've got all the data you need and available in C. And the, if you're interested, the code that's actually used to access it is really just a series of assignments to assign from the this weird structure that DTC creates into your correct one, the normal one that you would use with device tree. And if that's enabled, you do you do this special code to, to copy things over. And that's much smaller code than having libftt in there. Uh, a couple of other things to mention. There's Android bootloader support, AVB. Lib, lib AVB is in U-boot now. And there's, a, uh, there's also an opt driver, although no command. Uh, so that, there's an example of a, of a boot flow there, very simple. Uh, you run through these, this verify command. If it verifies, then all is good. Otherwise, you've got a problem. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, I think it's the third or fourth verify boot. Uh, mechanism in U-Boot now. U-Boot, uh, sometime this year, moved to GitLab. And uh, I quite like it. Um, it's, it does similar things to Travis. It's a little more integrated. Uh, essentially, when you push a commit up to GitLab, it goes ahead and builds it for you and tells you whether there's any problems. And you can see, see the actual errors and so on. Uh, so, so that's fairly new. We're still using Travis CI, but um, we'll see how it goes. If you've got a build server sitting around not doing anything and want to hook it up to provide capacity, please don't let me stop you. Which leads me on to this, uh, which I, I think is uh, really cool. U-Boot's uh, firmware's not the best place for testing. Quite often, when people write firmware, they just write the code and they manually test it and they don't change it ever, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, or maybe there's a lot of manual, manual testing or functional testing of the actual device and that sort of thing. With U-Boot in the last several years, there's been an effort to increase the amount of automated testing that's available. So there is a, um, there is a thing called PyTest. It's basically a number of unit tests and functional tests that are, that are built into U-Boot. Things like, for example, do, does, do the file systems work? Can I you know, write and read files in the, with the file system support? Uh, can, do all of the different uh, device tree, uh, sorry, driver model uh, U classes actually work? For example, 
is a test that uh, basically uses a simulated USB stick. It goes and tries to read you know, a couple of blocks off that simulated USB stick. Obviously, that requires going right through the whole USB stack, and therefore we get some uh, feeling that, that that kind of works. Um, when you run, uh, it's actually make Q check, or make, make check, it will run all these tests. It takes about a minute or so, uh, including, including all these things. And they, they use Sandbox uh, when you run them on your machine. The test can also run on QMU, or they can run on real hardware with, with appropriate hooks. And there's a thing called T-Bot. Is anyone using T-Bot? Is anyone familiar with that? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Uh, so I don't, uh, I guess it's not widely used, but this is, this is very flexible. It lets you test U-boot, uh, Linux, and, and beyond and, uh, on real hardware, and it collects the, uh, the information, the failures, and that sort of thing. So I think what's going to happen over the next few years is more and more of this stuff is going to, um, it's going to be, become possible. Traditionally, or more recently, there has been this use of these Wi-Fi flash sticks. They, you know, you can, they're used for cameras, but you can basically send U-boot over to it and then reboot the device with, the, with the, some sort of power control module, and that allows you to test that it's working. But there is this uh, thing which I recently discovered, and maybe I'm just slow, uh, which is called SD-Wire, which plugs into your board and, and then connects to your... Uh, development machine via USB. So now you can control, you can write to, uh, to the SD uh, card over USB, some sort of new U-boot, Linux, whatever, and then use power control to reboot it. And now you can, and obviously access the console and see, see what's happening there. So connecting that to GitLab, I think will happen, hopefully as well, you know, more and more people will have these things running automated tests <coughs> on, on actual real hardware. So U-Boot supports EFI, the EFI interface. Effectively, uh, you, can boot, you can boot, for example, well, you can boot Linux, but you can boot Grub2 uh, and use that. And um, the, uh, this, this came from some work uh, from Susie, and I think it's been fairly widely publicized. There have been a few talks about it. Uh, essentially, with this, uh, you, can, you can run an EFI application. U-Boot provides console support, serial support, network disk, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then you don't, so you don't actually need UEFI as such if your platform uh, supports U-Boot. And there's pretty good tests associated with that as well. Um, there's a recent change to use restructured text for documentation and also the documentation, this is a large amount of documentation in U-Boot. It's all sort of traditionally been in this big doc directory and you kind of grip for it really because otherwise you couldn't figure out where it is. So, so, this is, so now it's kind of moving to being inside a, a directory which mirrors the architecture and the board directories. So for example, you'll put your board or documentation in doc board and then the name of your board, that kind of thing. So I think that will, it's, a, it's a minor change, but it, it should help uh, people find things a bit more easily. Uh, and I'm just going to mention some things, some other random things. Uh, these are things that I've worked on and um, that I wanted to, uh, you have to put up with me talking about, basically. It won't take too long. So the first thing is Binman. Binman is a firmware packer. It's not, it's not widely used. It's used by SunXI, Integra, and a few other things, in x86. Uh, it's written in Python. It, it, basically, the way you use it is you put a device tree description of your image in, in, in there somewhere. And when you run Binman, it will automatically produce an image. Here you can see it's taking the SPL. It's taking the image. It's creating a, <laughs> it's a bit weird, but this is, uh, have you heard of Core Boot? It's another bootloader. Um, the state is making a core boot file system with these three files in it, you know, with some compression and so on. So that's what Binman does. It's basically a one-pass uh, firmware packer based on a configuration description. So it's not sort of run lots of commands to build up your image. You just describe it in one place and it very quickly puts it together. It's very handy for complex images, you know, when you've got to sign a particular piece of the image and put, some, put that data somewhere else and all that kind of thing. Uh, so the status of this is it's it's kind of I wouldn't call it feature complete, but it's 
it's been in use for a, a while, and uh, recently it's had a bit more effort, and we'll work on it, and we'll see how it goes. Um, so those of you who know me uh, a little bit over the years, I'm not, uh, traditionally have not had a huge amount of interest in uh, x86 stuff. However, uh, for various reasons, I, I was the, briefly the x86 maintainer for Yubu. Uh, we now have a much better maintainer, luckily. Um, but I still maintain some interest in it. And U-Boot supports bare metal operation on uh, various different x86 CPUs. Uh, traditionally, uh, x86 uses you know, UFI and core boot and so on, but uh, with the Intel FSP that's, that's become kind of standard now, um, there's actually not that much code needed in the bootloader. A lot of it is in the FSP. Um, in fact, Intel has a thing called Slim Bootloader. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah, it's very new, but uh, this effectively lets you uh, boot using the FSP, this sort of bi binary blob stuff that, that Intel provides, and very quickly get, a, get something running on, on the platform. And Slim Bootloader recently supports uh, U-Boot as a payload, so you can jump into U-Boot and then have all these features, you know, all the U-Boot features that you, like, that you expect, but you haven't had to do very much work. <laughs> so x86, uh, it's an interesting um, environment. I'll just quickly mention logging. Um, again, it's, it's not widely used, it's fairly new. But if you build, for example, if you build U-Boot with all the logging enabled and run it, it will produce huge amounts of uh, stuff. All the debugs turn into you know, printfs or whatever. Um, so there's, a, there's an ability now to categorize things. You know, let's say, for example, it's a USB message or a spy flash mes message, and you can filter accordingly. There's different levels from you know, debug up to um, info or warning or critical or whatever. And, and some little helpers like this thing here, which uh, if, if there was an error, um, then we just return the, we, we, we log a message and return the error. Now this gets cut down to just simply a return of the error, but if you've got logging enabled, you get a message telling you why it returned with an error. This can be very handy when you're trying to debug a particular driver or whatever. Um, so again, it's not really widely used, but I think um, we'll start to see this sort of thing used a bit more. And uh, Patman is really, really old. I really shouldn't be. I was. I really shouldn't be talking about this in something that's new. But many people are not aware of it. It's just a little tool which lets you essentially send, build in a patch set, and send it to a mailing list. Here we're going to send it to U-Boot, we're going to CC this guy, and we're going to, here's our cover letter, and it will just produce the patches, tidy them up, and email them off for you, we'll let you check them first, and that kind of thing. So I just mentioned that. Um, I'm not going to do a little demo, uh, it doesn't run on my Chromebook. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to talk at the end about uh, what U-Boot might look like in a few years. So U-Boot is, it's very hard to predict because it's very much set by contributors. People, someone will turn up and say, gosh, I wish U-Boot could, you know, had EFI support, or I wish it supported RISC-V, or whatever it might be. And we never really know, you know, never really predict. It's, it basically is driven by the market and by, you know, technical demands, right? Um, and so uh, lots of random things uh, come along out of the blue. Uh, U-Boot is basically there to quickly and easily boot your system into an operating system and whatever that system might look like. And so as systems change and as trends change and so on, U-Boot's obviously going to evolve. But here's a few things that I think uh, I can predict with some confidence. I mentioned the, the uh, test farm business and I think, I think we'll likely see a lot of custodians having two or three boards or four boards sitting there running tests, pointing to a particular <coughs> tree, maybe it's master or some of, the other, some of the other trees on GitLab, and running automated tests and emailing me or somebody when they break, when they break things. So the, I, for example, I know that NVIDIA does this because every now and then I'll get an email from some, some automated thing at NVIDIA saying, you broke this. Um, not very often, I should, I should hasten to say, but um, but yeah, I don't think there's very many companies doing that. I've listed some I think do it, but uh, it's not widely, widespread. I think that will grow. And the benefit is that regressions should become less common. Uh, 
At the moment, if you're using a really widely used board, it, it pretty much always works. But if you're using some weird board that, you know, and, and you've, it's been two years since you updated U-Boot and you're going back to update it, then maybe there'll be a problem because it's not getting a lot of testing. I think the driver model migration it will start to come to an end. Uh, there's quite a lot of deadlines this year for most of the subsystems. And kconfig, I think there used to be 9,000 config options. We still have 4,500 sort of out there. Most of them are board specific, but I think that, that migration maybe will come to an end at some point <coughs> before the end of the universe. I think we're going to see more Linux code in U-Boot. Some of the subsystems that are coming around, there's a lot of pressure to make them work in a similar way and be able to update them from Linux back and forth and that sort of thing. So I think that's something we'll see. Uh, and I'd like to see this, but I don't know if it'll happen. That new code comes with tests. So when you write a new file, when you do a new file system or a new driver or whatever, there's a test that goes along with it to make sure that it works and that nobody breaks it down the track. And finally, um, U-Boot U-Boot just keeps sort of getting slightly bigger. A few bytes here, a few bytes there, little little new features and so on. And uh, it's extremely configurable. You can turn off an awful lot of stuff. You know, you can turn off the command line, for example, and save a huge amount. But uh, I do have this creeping concern that, uh, you know, it's, it's getting a little bit bigger to do the same thing as it did, you know, 10 years ago. And so I think uh, we'll likely see some effort in that, in that area to sort of start to trim it down a little bit as well. So, uh, sorry, that was a little bit abbreviated due to my... Uh, laptop fell up, but uh, thank you for listening. I do want to say, uh, if you've never seen a patch to the U-Boot mailing list, now would be a great time to do it. It's a pretty uh, friendly mailing list. Uh, I think people, uh, most of the time, uh, you know, are all in it together and get on pretty well, and, they, and they're happy to help. There's a IRC as well, where people are always helping out. I'm not very good at that. But... Uh, but yeah, and if you have any trouble, please sing out. My details at the bottom, if you email the U-Boot mailing list and CC me, you'll get me. So that's it. I don't know if anyone wants to uh, have any questions, but uh, thank you very much. I have a question. Sure. Are you talking about Buildman? Yeah, uh, I think so, yeah. This thing? Yeah. Um, better in what way? Okay. No, I'm just, like, I'm wondering why, like, do you want to build saturation of the time? Do you need something like S-Tape or something? If you're building your own board, you'll typically do an, you'll just use make, or use an incremental build. Okay. Um, yes, you can use Buildman every time you want to build for your board, but it's not, very efficient for that. It's more to do uh, with... Oh, all of them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'd love to improve it. Uh, it's basically, it doesn't use... It, it's incremental in the sense that when it builds the first commit the, and then it builds the next ones, they are incremental. So it's not just rebuilding each one. It's relatively fast. I mean, I know 24 hours to build 200,000 commits is not too bad. Yes, there's a config file that lets you select the tool chain, so you can do what you want there. But um, yeah, patches are definitely welcome. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Yes? LPDDR training. Well, I'm seeing, for example, Rockchip uh, recently moved to using TPL jumping to SPL and doing, you know, doing the training there because it's so, in, the code is so large. So, yeah, I think, I don't know where that's going to go. Uh, I've also just recently been looking at um, Intel uh, Apollo Lake, and I think it's, it needs 180K of memory for the mem in it uh, phase, and it takes uh, something like 30 seconds, 25 seconds to do the memory training. So while I think you might have problems, they're probably not as bad as that. Uh, it's, it is a challenge that the technology is getting more and more bleeding edge and more and more advanced. And um, yeah, I'm not too sure where that's going to end, end up. Mm. 
Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for listening. Thank <clears throat> you.